Century Focus, the podcast that dives into a different sector of the stock market each day. I'm your host, Emily Flippin. I'm Jason Moser. I'm Nick Seipel. I'm Dylan Lewis. And today we're talking financials. Today we're talking consumer goods. Wild Card Wednesday. And we're talking energy. And today we're talking tech. Let's dive in. It's Friday, August 20th, and we're talking about free investing tools. I'm your host, Dylan Lewis, and I'm joined by Fool.com's favorite frenzied fall boy of fostering free financial fun, Brian Feroldi. Brian, how you doing? Did you like that one, Dylan? That was good. I thought that was, I, you know, you, you did you hear me just like slowly pause just to make sure that I was getting it right? Yes, I'm judging you <laughs> intensely every time you're going over my title. And yet again, you do a good job. Uh, well, the F alliteration there is because today is free. Today we are talking about uh, what free tools are out there for the average investor. Um, and I think, Brian, but before we get too deep into this discussion, it's it's a great topic and it's one that we are so excited to talk about because at core with The Fool, we are, we are all about access for everyone. We are all about democratizing access to information, access to the financial markets, all of these things. We know what an incredible wealth generator the stock market and investing can be. It's easy to forget if you've only been an investor for the last 20 years, like me, you know, I'm, I'm only 30, um, it has not always been this way. Uh, we have not always had so many free tools available to us. Uh, between the advent of the internet, and I, I feel like I'm like 80 years old saying that, uh, and some very specific regulations uh, that require companies to make all of the information available to everyone, um, we are kind of in the golden age for individual investors. We really are. I mean, if you took the internet away from me and said invest, I would be like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, I literally would have no way of getting the information that I need to make investing decisions. So, yes, investors today are so extremely spoiled that we have instant access to high quality data for free. Because to your point, if you rewind the clock to just even the mid nineties, getting in, getting in any information was not only really hard and time consuming to do, you probably had to pay for it. Yeah. And and I think if if you were looking for a major turning point in the relationship that individual investors had with publicly traded companies, it probably is 2000. Um, in part because technology was catching up and we had we had widespread uh, internet um, and, and people were able to access information, but also because that is where Reg FD was passed. And and this is a technical thing that I think does not get enough love. Um, and I'm going to borrow directly from a fool.com page here. Before the passage of Reg FD, individual investors were often the last to learn the details of new products, receive warnings about earning shortfalls, or be notified about management changes. Professional financial institutions enjoyed substantial information advantages and were often the same entities delivering financial news to the rest of the marketplace. The investing arms of these institutions profited by using not yet public information to make stock purchases on sale decisions. In October of 2000, the SEC ruled that selective disclosures violate the spirit of public markets and implemented regulation fair disclosure. Many influential players in the financial services industry, industry strenuously objected and claimed that Reg FD increased volatility, stifled corporate disclosure, and eroded the relationship between public markets and their financiers. But Reg FD passed and was hailed as a huge victory for individual investors. And one factor that led to the rules passage was overwhelming support and awesomely enough, The Fool was a major player in that, rallying folks um, to send in responses to the SEC in support of Reg FD. And <laughs> the approximation was that two-thirds of letters that were sent there um, actually came by way of The Fool, either uh, directly from employees or from people that The Fool had urged to send those letters along. Um, this is the foundation, Brian, in a lot of ways that we are even having this conversation today on. Isn't that crazy? In 1999, which wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things, it was legal for companies to give insider information to some of their investors, but not to release it to the general public. Like that blows my mind that that was even a thing, but that is how Wall Street operated for more than a century. Yeah. And I mean, if there's any persistent truth about financial markets and incentives, uh, People are going to hoard advantages uh, wherever they can, right? And it's just because there's there's profit making opportunities there. Um, always looking to level the playing field, and this is really what has given us the widespread information that we now have access to. 
Um, I think we can't possibly talk about free investing tools, Brian, without starting with the SEC and the Edgar database. This is probably the number one resource that is out there. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people that are investing that are not using it, especially individual investors. The reason there is if you click over to this, it looks and feels like a government website. It's it's like you're filing a tax uh, form. When you dig into the details of this, some of the filing names that you have to dig through, they are confusing. So we're going to break down the most important ones in as easy as a way that we can. So the mo the number one document that I go to when I'm trying to research a company is the most recent 10 K. That is the annual report for the company, and it is filled with all the information that you could possibly want about a company. It's business, it's market opportunity, it's competition, management discussions are, are in there, uh, financial results, it's balance sheet, um, and accompanying that is another uh, is another document that is also the second document that I go to, which is the DEF 14A. DEF14A. Another name for that is the proxy statement, but that is going to show you all the details about management compensation and how much stock each uh, insider owns. So those two documents right there, the 10K and the DEF14A, also called the proxy statement, are a great starting point. They are. And, and while, yes, it, it does have the appearances of, of a government website, and it is, I think, Spartan, um, and maybe not as, uh, as, as flashy as people might expect from, from private industry. Uh, one thing that I do think the SEC and the government does very well here is if you go to like sec.gov slash Edgar, um, and, and, and you're searching for a specific ticker, um, say you pull up Apple, AAPL, um, when you click into that, the selected filings that they highlight, two of them are right there that you just talked about, you know, or, or maybe more. The, the 10K is right there. The 10Q, the quarterly reports is right there. The proxy's there. We also have an 8K and we have ownership disclosures. So at least those are front and center for people. Um, and while it may not be the most user-friendly site, um, boy, are we lucky to have it. We certainly are. And again, it's amazing the amount of information that you can get just by digging through uh, the, the SEC documents. Some other ones that our, user, our listeners might be more familiar with is when a company files to come public, one of the documents that they need to file is called an S1. That is essentially kind of like the annual report, but prior to a company coming public. It's all the information that we use to fill out our show notes on a company uh, before they come public. When an S1 comes public, sometimes a lot of information is missing, such as what is the offering price? How much are they going to raise? Uh, so because of that, some information is not filled in, such as ownership and what the post IPO balance sheet looks like. Sometimes after a company comes public or after a company comes public, they have to file an S1A. And that A at the end means here is the missing information that we didn't have prior to the prospectus. So that is another form that you need to be on the lookout for. Yeah, and I think one thing that is kind of nice um, is if you do not feel like using the SEC interface, um, you can kind of be lazy and search for any company that is is newly public or that you're trying to get your hands on the S1, for example. Uh, and you know, in, in the case of a business that we've talked about somewhat recently on the show, a couple months ago, Olo. Say you're looking for the S1, Olo S1. Drop that into Google because it's a government website, and Google tends to prioritize government resources, um, it is the first result. It's unavoidable. And so that's going to take you right into um, the document and be able to have you scroll through there and see everything you need. And and trust me, everything you need and more is going to be in that document because there's, there's almost no one that reads the entirety of these things, Brian. It's just too big. They are huge. They are a few hundred <laughs> pages long in some cases, and they're filled with legalese. So thankfully, once you've read through a couple of them, you know what parts you can skim over and what parts you need to focus on. Yeah, that's right. And and I think we, we wanted to start this conversation here um, with SEC and Edgar because this is really the primary source of information. This is what we're getting straight from the company. Um, and, it, and I think it's helpful to start there um, in part because you are making your own decision about anything you're seeing. Um, I know for, for me personally, Brian, I really like to have a fresh look at almost any company that I'm going to be discussing. Um, we're going to get into a lot of other places that we turn for information, uh, YouTube channels, Twitter handles, um, different sites that add great commentary and context. But I think it's important for people to form their own opinion, especially as you're learning to invest 
on a company, see what you pick up on, see what you notice, and then turn to those secondary sources and say, okay, you know, I wonder what these other people are noticing and what they're picking up when they look at this company as well. Yeah, I, lo- I love that. I mean, when I hear about stocks from other fools, especially ones that I respect, their opinion always like sullies my, my, my opinion about the company. If I'm like, oh, Emily, Emily doesn't like this company. As I'm reading through it, I'm like, I have a negative connotation in my mind. So yes, to your point, sometimes going to the primary documents first and then talking to other investors is the way to go. Yeah. And, and we have, in addition to the information that comes uh, from SEC and Edgar, uh, the company's investor relations page. And and I think this is another just wonder of the of the internet where um, if you search any company and investor relations, you're going to be taken right to the page uh, where they make all of this available. Generally, it's going to be in a little bit of a prettier format uh, than what you might get from SEC and Edgar. Um, and anything accompanying earnings in terms of presentations, conference calls, slide decks, um, any shareholder letters, that's all going to be there. And that's all great stuff for people to spend time with. Yeah, there's tons of information right on the company's website. So after the SEC filings, or you can even get the SEC filings right on the company's website, company's investor relations pages are treasure choice of data. I know some investors that say they don't like to look at presentations simply because they know it's management spin on everything. I actually really like looking through them, especially in the beginning, because it gives you a fast overview of the key information about a company. I will never rely just on a presentation to make an investment decision, but as far as getting a quick view of what the company does, what's the opportunity, what's the management team, I think presentations are an excellent tool. I think that's right. It's it's a... Uh... It's a guided tour through a company to some extent, right, Brian? Like management showing you the things that they'd like for you to focus on uh, in some of those presentations, and it's always good to bounce that against all the information that they have to provide on their business, um, just so that you're not losing any important narratives. But it's good to know, you know, exactly uh, where they're prioritizing, uh, what their focuses are, all that kind of stuff. Um, one other reason that I think it it can be really helpful um, to go over to an IR page is. If uh, leadership at a company is making an appearance somewhere, um, generally, it'll wind up there. So if it's outside of the regular earnings cadence, if they're making a presentation at an industry conference or something like that, very often that's going to wind up on the IR page, uh, in part because of the Reg FD uh, disclosure, I think. Um, but, But that's a great resource that can often be overlooked too. It certainly is. And one thing to note about that is depending on the company, some of them only have one presentation uploaded at a time. And if they post a new one, they will delete an old one. So some, if you're a company, if you're planning on tracking a company over time, it can be helpful when you view a presentation to just right click it and save it to your local doc so that it doesn't disappear from the internet. <laughs> um, Brian, so, so those are our, our primary resources. Um, we're going to kind of turn over to uh, what's kind of a secondary filter for us. And so I would generally turn to all of these things as we, as I've already, you know, had an opportunity to kind of establish an opinion about a company, um, and and kind of at least get some bullets down on what I think. Um, it's a toss up here in terms of order and prioritization. There are a bunch of different directions you can go here, but I think we're putting a lot of the classic social media stuff into this bucket. Uh, it's Twitter and it's YouTube. Yeah, both of those are really fantastic uh, resources. Yes, there's plenty of noise on those platforms, but there are also some some creators on there that share information with others investors freely and are just there to to help and and bounce ideas off of you. So you do have to be choosy with who you follow, with what YouTube channels that you subscribe to, but I think that YouTube and Twitter are two excellent resources for investors. They are. And in addition to just, you know, commentary on companies, I think something that is like so therapeutic about how I've curated my Twitter feed is when things are going crazy and I go to my Twitter feed, like say, say the market is sold off three or 4% um, because of who I follow and the fact that they are for the most part, long-term buy and hold investors. Most of the stuff that I am met with there is focused on playing the long game. When, when I go and I'm getting news and, you know, a company had uh, what looked like great earnings, but because of market conditions, you know, had sold off maybe double digit percentages. Um, I have a stream of people that are saying, it's okay. <laughs> and, and I think from a, from a mindset perspective, um, that's incredibly useful, Brian. 
Having a community of people to go to when your portfolio is getting smashed is really important. So like you, I have handpicked everyone that I follow on Twitter and almost all of them are long-term investors. So yes, like you said, when the markets, when my portfolio is getting hit really bad, nothing makes me feel better than connecting with other like-minded investors. Yeah. And I'll say, I mean, you are a great follow on Twitter at Brian Froldy, um, and and a steady source of good keep calm uh, <laughs> type stuff when things are going crazy. A lot of our other Fool contributors are awesome follows, um, and then there's folks outside the Fool. I mean, like I think you know Morgan Housel is an incredible follow. That's that's not going to blow anyone's mind. You know uh, that that regularly tunes into stuff from the Fool. Um, you know they know we love him, but but I think there's also some great industry specific analysts. I mean Beth Kindig uh, at Beth underscore Kindig, incredible tech analyst great follow if you're looking for some in-depth insights. Um, anyone in particular that, that you want to give some shine to, Brian? Oh, so uh, just one person that comes to mind immediately is a guy named Jamin Ball. Uh, we've had him on a full live before. He is a software as a service investor, and he maintains this incredible database of all the publicly traded software as a service company. And he regularly sends out valuation metrics, growth rates, ranks about how expensive they are, price movements, et cetera. So he is a wonderful resource. But to your point, there are so many people on Twitter that are just like uh, Jamin, just like Morgan House, so that they are there to provide good, positive information. You just have to make sure you seek out and follow just those people and block the people that are, say, more focused on short-term things. Yeah, stay away from the double candlesticks. You know, just <laughs> focus on focus on the long term buy and hold, folks. Um, and and when I think when it comes to YouTube, what's what's nice is in addition to you know a lot of folks doing um, you know ten or fifteen minute overviews of companies. And Brian, you do that on your channel, and it's and it's awesome. Um, it's a great source for CEO interviews and perspectives from company leadership. And I know you know we 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 have uh, Glassdoor in her site and some of the more cultural elements as part of this. And that's part of the, the checklist for how we look at businesses. I will say, I'll look at Glassdoor ratings and then I honestly wanna hear management talk and I wanna hear them explain the vision uh, and just kind of see what their demeanor's like. And that's where I think YouTube is incredibly useful. Yeah, and there's nothing like watching a CEO talk and seeing an interview. How do they answer questions? Are they focused on the short term? Are they focused on the long term? Are they good at communicating? That is one of the key skills that all CEOs need to have. So YouTube, like you said, is an incredible resources for finding high quality, in-depth interviews with, with CEOs. And to your point, just by watching them talk and seeing how they communicate, you can get those, your spidey senses can tell you if this is someone you can trust or not. Yeah, and, and it's nice. Like very often, you'll have you know Bloomberg or CNBC hosting um, executives immediately after earnings, or in the lead up to earnings, or right after a company has gone public, and you can just kind of get a sense of you know what management's priorities are, what they're excited about. You know, if if they dramatically underpriced an IPO, are they excited about that, or you know, do they feel like they left money on the table? Um, and you know, getting some of those perspectives, it's not going to drive your investing thesis, but it's very often going to give you a much better feel for who's running the show and and really you know where their heads at. And another thing that you can use it is if a company is overly uh, overly uh, available to the public, if they are regularly on CNBC or if they're regularly out there prom promoting their stock, that should tell you something that maybe they're not focused enough on the business. They're focused too much on promoting themselves and the stock. So that can also be an indicator for you. Yeah, and I think re related to YouTube, you know, we have uh, you know podcasts are an incredible resource. Um, I, I find that YouTube's a little bit easier for finding specifically who I want to talk to, in part because you know it's owned by Google, and when it comes to search, they're they're pretty darn good. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, podcast search functionality is a little bit rougher, but there are a lot of really great programs out there that I think do a good job of breaking down uh, a variety of things. You know, some of them specifically around building businesses, some of them on market commentary. Um, but you know, Brian, I'm curious, what, what do you regularly listen to? What's in, what's in heavy rotation for you there? I have over 40 podcasts that are related to business and investing that I regularly listen to. Uh, but some of my favorites are How I Built This. That is when uh, an NPR co host named Guy Raz interviews the founder of a company. And they have had tons of founders on there that are full favorites. And they were just walked through, what was it like for you in the very beginning of this company? How'd you come up with the idea? What struggles did you overcome? Always fascinating to hear those founder stories. Uh, some other ones that I like is uh, I listen to every single podcast that The Motley Fool produced 
excuses, rule breakers investing, Motley Fool answers, Motley Fool foolery. Uh, I am one of the dozens, uh, essentially. I am one of the original dozens. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, I also like a lot of other podcasts. Uh, one of my favorites on, on um, personal finance is Choose FI. Uh, I like a podcast called Acquired, which is kind of uh, some more details about the inner workings of, of businesses. Chit Chat Money is a is a smaller podcast that does deep dives into into businesses and another podcast I like is called We Study Billionaires. There are dozens of really high quality podcasts out there that are focused on business and investing. Yeah, and I'll confess I've used How I Built This as research for shows that we were doing, you know, because I wanted the long form uh, understanding of the founder story. Um, it it doesn't often get into the nuts and bolts of, you know, the company numbers or anything like that, but it does really help you understand where that company came from. Um, and really, you know, kind of similar to our CEO interview discussion with YouTube, what's, what's guiding that company, what the mission is and, and what motivates, uh, leadership. Um, if you're interested, this is, this isn't so much an ongoing benefit type thing, but if you're interested in that build up too, I will throw out there the first season of the startup podcast is probably one of the best business shows I've ever listened to. Um, in part because you generally don't have widespread access to those early days of founding a business, and that's precisely what that show is. Brian, I don't know if you've listened to that, not only have I listened to that, I specifically switched from using the Apple Podcast app to using Spotify as my primary way to listen to podcasts because I wanted to listen to Startup again. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, it's from Gimlet Media, uh, and it's basically the backstory of, of Alex Lumberg uh, founding uh, Gimlet Media and going through the the funding rounds, like understanding how to raise capital. Um, and, and it's just a very unique perspective on the challenges that go into that space. And so I, I have found... Um, while it's not really helpful for any one company in terms of better understanding like how, say, like Spotify works, um, super helpful in understanding the early challenges that entrepreneurs run into. And so I think for that reason, um, it should be almost required listening um, for, for anyone that's interested in the space and wants to get a better grip uh, on entrepreneurship. Um, all right, Brian, we're mixing media here. Uh, we've done video We've done social media. We've done podcasts. Uh, let, let's let's talk about legacy online media here because uh, there there are tons of folks um, that are that are making stuff uh, super digestible for people. And I'm just gonna throw in a shameless plug here for Fool.com. I've been reading from Fool.com <laughs> for more than 15 years, and I have learned so much from uh, from reading it. Even if you're not a paid subscriber, Fool.com has tons of articles about uh, stocks that you've never heard of. They do analysis. They also do plenty of uh, articles on 10% movers. There's also a wonderful underutilized tool on the Motley Fool called Motley Fool Caps, which is where anyone can go and publicly pick stocks, saying if they're going to beat the market or lose to the market. That's a great place to go to see what investors are worth listening to and following, those that put up the best track record. And more recently, you can actually now go to fool.com to not only get stock information and data, but you can get earnings transcripts. So fool.com, great resource. Yeah, I think earnings transcripts are absolutely huge. Um, I mean, that is that is something that I think was one of the the later dominoes to fall for people having access. There, there are some providers out there that have been doing it for a long time, but, but that generally has been something that has been behind the paywall of relatively expensive financial products for a long time. I'm, I'm thrilled that we make that available. I like that we have our 10% mover series. It's so helpful for me when I see something in my portfolio that has moved 15%, positive or negative, um, to quickly be able to find that piece and say, okay, this is why. I'm going to do more homework later, but at least know like the quick snippet for what's going on here. Um, and, and Brian, I think related to earning stuff, one tool that I think is it's it's relatively new and I'm relatively floored by uh, is Quarter. Um, this is also playing into the the earnings call game. Um, it's a tool that I use. I know it's it's a tool that you use as well. It's it's a new app and uh, it it basically is like the Spotify but for earnings calls. Sure, I think that that's fair, <laughs> and it's pronounced it, it, it's spelled Q U A T R, and there's often there's sometimes an S E uh, at Q -U -A -R -T -R. the end. Q U A R T R. Q U yeah, there you go. Q U A R T R <laughs> quarter, and it is an app that you can use to go on to favorite uh, companies, and then the earnings calls, the the recordings from those calls 
come to you. What's really useful about Quarter is that you can skip through the call. You can skip over the standard language legalese at the beginning. You can skip right to, to Q&A. And you can also fast forward, rewind, 2x, and go backwards and forwards. So oftentimes, I'm listening to a call, and I'm like, what did they just say? I didn't hear it or something was going on. It's really nice just to go, go back 10 seconds and listen to that to that part again. So it's a great tool. It is. And they also have, um, you know, any supplemental materials uh, like PDFs or anything like that are just right there within the play interface. So you can click on them and follow along, uh, which is super helpful. So, you know, if, if you don't want to go find it on the company IR page and you want to listen to the call, it's you don't have to hunt for it. It's going to be there for you. Um, I like that you can jump to the Q&A. Um, they have an event sync for calendars, which is pretty cool. So if you want to throw something on your calendar, you're able to. Uh, Super neat tool. Uh, I know it's available on iOS. I think it's available uh, on Android now as well. Um, that that's that's something I'm pretty excited about because it is nice to be able to step away from the computer and listen to stuff. Um, and I have found myself using that a decent amount uh, in the last couple months. I love going on walks and I love going on runs and it's really helpful if I have an earnest call that I want to listen to to just put it on two x speed, download it, and run away. <laughs> run away, Brian. Run away. <laughs> Um, fueled by the, the sweet nothings of management teams. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the motivation for your run. Um, I, I think outside of that stuff, Brian, we, we can kind of get more into folks that do some of the work for you. Um, and this is like kind of another bucket of, of tools that we're regularly making use of. No shortage of these um, in, in the finance industry. And they're pretty awesome tools that are available for free. Yeah. One of my favorites that I use regularly is a free screening tool called FinViz, F-I-N-V-I-Z. -I, I think that stands for financial visualizations. This is by far the best free screening tool that I've ever, that I've ever come across. You can go on there and they have a database of thousands of companies and you can sort them by industry, by sector, by market cap, by earnings date, by year to date performance, by long term performance, uh, et cetera. So when we're doing shows and we're looking for ideas on say tech stocks that are down year to date, the number one place I go to find that information is Finviz. Yeah. And I know screening can be, um, a slippery slope, you know, it, it can definitely lead you to like, if, if you're using screening as your main filtering for making investing decisions, um, I would say like maybe revisit the way that you're, you know, finding stock ideas, but it's super helpful as a way to at least put some names on your radar that, that maybe you wouldn't have noticed. Um, and it's a really easy way to kind of make sense of the market, understand what's moving, um, all that kind of stuff. I think whale wisdom, uh, is another huge, huge tool, um, for, for aggregating stuff. This really gets into Brian, like what big investors are doing the, uh, the folks that are managing money for institutions. Yeah, Whale Wisdom, it's W-H-A-L-E-W-I-S-D-O-M.com. If you are a fan of tracking big investors, like if you find a hedge fund manager or a mutual fund manager and you're just like, I like this person's investing style and I want to own them, you can go on Whale Wisdom, type in that person's uh, fund name, and it'll show you all the stocks that they hold, how those numbers have changed over time, and you can actually set up automatic alerts to get uh, to get new SEC filings sent to you for when that investor uh, posts. So, uh, for, for example, uh, Chuck uh, Chuck Aker, pretty sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's one of my favorite investors to follow. I really like his style. So every 90 days, whenever his portfolio is released to the public, I get an email that shows here are all his holdings. One thing I like about him is they don't change that much because he is a long-term investor, but there are several investors that I have that for. And oftentimes, if a big investor that I respect has all of a sudden taken a huge position in a company, that can be an indication. Maybe I should do some research on it. Yeah, I think that that's a great way to put stocks on your radar. You know, you never want to be making investing decisions based solely on what other people are doing. Um, and and I think you know, whale wisdom uh, is is able to do what it does again thanks to the regulators, right? We we have 13F filings. Uh, it's a quarterly report that it's required to be filed by all institutional investment managers with at least 100 million in AUM. So shout out to the regulators uh, and shout out to Information Transparency for making that happen. Um, Brian, as, as we wrap here, any other major tools that you want to highlight? There are several data aggregators out there that have been really useful. The most well-known of one is Yahoo Finance. There are some limitations to that, but that's a site that I regularly use. Some other high-quality data aggregators that have popped up are Ticker, T-I-K-R, Coifin, K-O-Y-F-I-N, 
Stock Row, S T O C K R O W, and Macro Trends, M A C R O T R E N D S. Um, another quick well, shout so I want to give a quick shout out to is called IPO Scoop. That's I P O S C O O P. That's a great place to go to get information on upcoming IPOs as well as past information on the last 100 uh, IPOs. So that can be a quick place to go through and scan for, uh, for ideas. So I realized that in the last 20 plus minutes, uh, we have thrown a lot at people. Um, and I imagine uh, in addition to furiously taking notes, uh, people have probably wondered, uh, okay, how, how do you make sense of all of this? And what does this look like for you in terms of uh, whether it's you know making investment decisions and how you kind of structure your research process or um, you know just within the cadence of kind of staying up to date on your portfolio in any given week or month? So Brian, I'm, I'm curious how all of this pieces together for you. Well, I think most listeners knows that both you and I are like to go through a systematic process with any investment that uh, we have. And we kind of, I, I've developed a checklist for myself that I use to go through and make sure that I'm checking every single thing that matters to me about an investment. So I do think it's important for investors to come up with a process and then use these resources to fill in that process. So these are tools that can help you come up with ideas, get information, but it's up to you to weigh those, weigh that information and choose what you're going to invest from there. So it's so important to come up with a research process and then consistently stick to it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we talked about all of these things that are so rich in information, but I think without structure, uh, it's a lot of noise. You know, there, there's there's no signal if you're not creating the systems to identify that signal and, and really make sure that um, you know what to be paying attention to. I will put in a shameless plug, Brian, for you uh, on Twitter at Brian Feroldi. You have your investing checklist available right there for people that want to access it. Um, I, I think you're 100% right, though. Like, my my process, I think, with investing was basically I started out looking at all the information, and as I started to understand what actually mattered, built the process, and now the process drives how I look at the information. So like you you kind of have to wade your way into it, um, and it changes over time. There there are things that I pay much 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 more attention to now uh, that I didn't, um, and I'm constantly you know looking for new sources of information, um, looking for new ways to present things. We didn't have you know some of these these earnings call. Um, audio offerings, for example, a little while ago. Uh, and so you always want to be stepping your game up. But what's what's nice is um, even if you just start and end with the primary sources, you're getting a, a huge chunk of the story. Yeah, for sure. Again, it's we're so spoiled that we have access to all this information, but it is on us to take this information, filter it down to the things that we actually care about, and then pay attention to that. And to your point, I used to do all this research and I would try and keep it in my head. Finally, I said, maybe I should write this down so I don't have to think about it all. So yeah, create a spreadsheet for yourself and come up with the factors, track them consistently. It'll help you so much. Yeah, and I feel lucky that you know we do the show every week, and I have years worth of notes in a Google Drive folder. You know, that's just every single week what we've talked about, and I've been able to go back over time and say, okay, um, this is what I thought about Apple in 2016. It looks like that came true. That's great. This is this is this is what I thought about Roku right after they came public. You know, Dylan, you were wrong. You were totally wrong about that. You underestimated their platform. Um, and and just being able to kind of keep score for yourself and understand how your process has changed, super useful. Um, and, and, and I think just a great way to continue to learn. You got it. Brian, we're spoiled for resources and I'm spoiled because I get to talk to you every week. Um, it's been a pleasure as always. Thanks so much for joining me on today's show. Thanks for having me, Dylan. Enjoy your vacation. Thanks. Listeners, that's going to do it for this episode of Industry Focus. If you have any questions or you want to reach out and say, hey, shoot us an email at industryfocus at fool.com or tweet us at MF Industry Focus. If you're looking for more of our stuff, subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, people on the program may own companies discussed on the show, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against stocks mentioned. So don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear. Thanks to Tim Sparks for all his work behind the glass today, and thank you for listening. Until next time, Fool on. 